Be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, make us worthy to celebrate the exaltation of your glorious cross with sacred hymns and with psalms. When you appear on the last day, and the sign of your cross will shine brighter than the sun, Gather us before you and surround us with your eternal light, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the Savior who made the wood of his cross a strong fortress for his flock, and established it is as a sign of the covenant for the salvation of his inheritance. By his cross he exalted his church and gave joy to all people who believed in it. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives, now and forever. Amen. O Christ our God, by your precious cross you have given us perfect salvation and have made us worthy to celebrate this feast with hymns of praise proclaiming, Blessed are you, O Lord of the Holy Cross, for you erased Adam's curse, and you restored his banished children to their inheritance. Blessed are you, O Holy Cross, for you have united earthly and he heavenly and earthly beings 
Blessed are you, O Holy Cross, for you have fulfilled the words of the prophets, enlightened the apostles in their preaching, crowned the martyrs for their faith, and honored the confessors for their loyalty. Now, O Christ, our Savior, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to make the celebration of the feast of the exaltation of your holy cross a sign of security and of peace. By your cross, exalt your holy church, guide her shepherds, adorn her priests with virtue. Purify her deacons, help the elderly, educate children, direct the young. Protect orphans, care for widows, and grant rest in your dwellings of light. To our brothers and sisters who have died, hoping in you. May we find refuge in the shadow of your life-giving cross on the great day of your second coming, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever. Jesus Christ, our Lord, accept these prayers and the fragrance of the incense that we have offered on this feast of the exaltation of your holy cross. May its sign always be visible before our eyes to strengthen us, that we may walk with you toward death and then stand at your right hand to celebrate the feast of your eternal victory. We glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Kaddishat, Aloha, Kaddishat, 
شاد خیل تو نو قادی شاد لامه تو sign of your cross, Lord, you ordain your holy priests, and they give us the mysteries through the power of your cross. reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Brothers and sisters, even if a person is caught in some transgression, you, who are spiritual, should correct that one in a gentle spirit, looking to yourself so that you also may not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he is deluding himself. Each one must examine his own work and then he will have reason to boast with regard to himself alone and not with regard to someone else. For each will bear his own load. One who is being instructed in the word should, care, should share all good things with his instructor. Make no mistake, God is not mocked. For a person will reap only what he sows because the one who sows for his flesh will reap corruption from the flesh. But the one who sows for the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Let us not grow tired of doing good, for in due time we shall reap our harvest if we do not give up. So then, while we have the opportunity, let us do good to all, but especially those who belong to the family of the faith. Praise be to God always.
Brahmar Arahodilan to the praise, glory and honor of the Master of the Trinity, Ghana Sinsons. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, O listeners, for the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you, listening with glory and thanks to the Word of the Living God. The Lord Jesus says, it shall be as when a man who was going on a journey called in his servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to a third one, each given according to his ability. Then he went away. Immediately the one who had received five talents went out and traded with them and made another five. Likewise, the one who received two made another two. But the man who had received one went off and dug a hole in the ground, and he buried his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and he settled accounts with them. The one who had received five talents came forward, bringing the additional five. And he said, Master, you gave me five talents. See, I have made five more. And his master said to him, Well done, my good and faithful servant. And since you were faithful in small matters, I shall give you great responsibilities. Come, enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received two talents also came forward. And he said, Master, you gave me two talents. And see, I have made another two. And his master said to him in reply, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Since you were faithful in small matters, I shall give you great responsibilities. Come, share in your master's joy. Then the one who had received one talent came forward, and he said, Master, I knew you were a demanding man, harvesting where you did not plant, and gathering up where you had not scattered. So out of fear, I went off and I buried your talent in the ground, but here it is back. His master said to him in reply, you wicked and you lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I do not plant and gather where I did not scatter. And you should, should you not then have put my money in the bank so that I could have gotten it back with interest on my return. Now then, take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will grow rich. But from the one who has not, even that which he has shall be taken away. And throw this useless servant into the outer darkness 
where there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. This is the truth, peace be with you. Let us never grow tired of doing what is good, for the time shall come when we will harvest. Then let us not grow tired. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So on this last Sunday of the liturgical year, we ask ourselves, are we builders or are we corruptors? Am I someone who builds things up, who notices the others around me and builds up, moves forward? Or am I a corrupter who only thinks mostly about my needs, my wishes, my desires? Because while I can have a concern about my own interests, the problem is, is when that is really central to my life, I don't see others and necessitates that I become a corrupter. This is what St. Paul is actually discussing when he writes to the letter to the Galatians. Letter to the Galatians is probably his earliest letter, his first letter, about, written about the year 48, 49, before the Council of Jerusalem, as it's called, written in the Acts of the Apostles. And so it's not insignificant that what St. Paul insists upon the fact is that collaborate, work together, build up, edify, move forward, and while you have time, do good. And so this letter is very simple in the reading, but it's a reminder, it's chosen to be read today certainly because it's a reminder to us of really what our lives are about. You know, we've lived through the last generations all about me. And of course, we've come to the technological full conclusion of me with social media where it's my Facebook, my tailored public image, my, 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 me, and we break down. It's why since the late 80s, early 90s, there's just been a breakdown of everything in any kind of, even on a natural level, of clubs. Bowling, things, teams, things, all the things that used to be teams and clubs and all, these things have also just disintegrated as we just collapse into our own little self-centered worlds. God only knows where this is going to finish in another generation or two. But the question really becomes for us as Catholics is, is do I build up? Am I part of building up the body of Christ or is it just about me? Where do I get my mass? Where do I get my things? Where do I get served? Instead of the collaboration of building up. And on this last Sunday of the liturgical year, it's important for us as we finish with this consideration of St. Ephraim to understand that St. Ephraim was a builder. And because he was a builder in his generation, and as a writer, we have the records of it, his building continues even to this day. His building up, his edification, his forming and moving forward still has benefits for us who live 1,600 years after him. Will the world be able to say that the same of you or I, of me? the work that we've done? Will there be a remnant? You live in the area of Waterville, you've lived here, you've watched five parishes close in the last decade. Where are the builders? Who are the corruptors? Where are the people who built these original parishes? Obviously, they, they personally have all died. What did they commit to the next generation? Something or nothing? 
St. Ephraim builds his writings and his teachings. Remember, in his last 10 years of his life, he's ordained to the diaconate in Edessa. But his teaching has been his entire lifetime. So as a catechist, he has been a builder by the very definition of communicating the gospel, explaining, clarifying points that are confusing, and expounding and unfolding to others. Which is why in this letter to the Galatians, St. Paul says, to the ones that you have received, he says, share all good things with those from whom you have received the word. In other words, in, in fact, in the Greek, it makes it very clear. To those who have been catechized, share all good things with those who have catechized you. Literally, it says in the Greek. But for most people, what is catechism? Horrible. I have to go on Saturday. I have to go on Sunday. I have to do this thing. I learn and memorize. Otherwise, I can't receive First Holy Communion. I can't be confirmed. That is not, the catechism is an unfolding of the beauty of the gospel and the healing of grace. But how many of us actually see that? Now for the children, you don't expect any other reaction. That's what we do as children, because children are all about me. And in theory, we're supposed to educate them to maturity, to move out of the me corruption and into the sense of noticing there's other things around me. I was telling someone recently, you know, when I look back over the decades, even at being ordained as a priest at 25, I had little awareness, really, because we didn't have televisions in our priories, we didn't, we didn't waste our time. So it wasn't like we were really paying much attention even to the news. So my young priesthood is the collapse of the Iron Curtain, the dissolution of the Soviet Union. It was background noise. I was catechizing. I was teaching in schools, I was doing this. But when I look back on it now, it's actually quite humorous. Because I really only see myself in a certain sense on a natural level, as kind of waking up at about the age of 35. And then all of a sudden in the 90s, I started paying attention to more things that were happening. But it's just one of those funny things. It's not wrong, it's just the way we live. When I'm 15, even when I'm 20, it's like I have no points of reference. I have no experience in the world. I think I know everything. But of course, I think I know everything because I have nothing to compare it to. You know, at 60, I know I know nothing. Because now I have experience of all the things that I didn't learn when I had the chance to learn them. And now what? I'm going to start studying Sanskrit? Well, maybe. But it's just part of the human psychology naturally. And that's why St. Paul reminds the Galatians in one of these earliest letters. To those you've received the word of healing, share. They have given you a gift that you can never remunerate for. Therefore, this participation, you build one another up. St. Ephraim was also an apologist. He defended the faith, not in arguments, not in trolling, not in getting in people's faces, but by unfolding and explaining as best that you can to elucidate, to shine light on the faith. And so he's also an apologist. And we mentioned the word apologia in, in Greek doesn't mean I'm sorry. That's what the word in English now means of apology shuffle your feet, stare at the ground, and kind of mumble out, I'm sorry. That's not an apology in the historical meaning of the word. Apologia means I'm giving a reason for why I did something. It's a justification of an action. So the great apologists in the first centuries of the church are giving reason why Christianity is believable and why it should be embraced. That's apology in the classic sense. Sorry means I'm in pain. The apology is a reason of why something is, has been done or been taught. And then thirdly, even within his immediate community, and this is a charming aspect of St. Ephraim. I mean, a couple of months ago, we talked about St. Ephraim as being ihidoyo, that idea of being solitary, single-minded, single vision. But of course, among them, you had both men and women. 
So then in the Syriac church in the first three centuries, the, the, you had the people who were living their normal lives with their families, but you also had a very large, uh, it's a minority, but still a very recognizable group of people who as adults, for the most part, in their conversions in the early centuries, who at their baptism embraced the celibacy. So there were men and there were women. They didn't live in convents or monasteries. That's for the future. But these are individuals who are living a solitary life consecrated, service to our Lord wholeheartedly. So one of the charming aspects about all of these songs and the hymns that St. Ephraim wrote, we know from the manuscripts, we know from the text, that they were written for women's choirs. So clearly there was a place in the liturgical life, in the church's life, in the ecclesial life, where you had just the women, ihidoyo, the women who were consecrated, who proclaimed and sang these magnificent songs, these hymns. And some of them are quite long. I mean, some of them have 100, 200 verses in them. So clearly, they have one that's written clearly for the vigil of Christmas night, for Christmas Eve, that has like 200 lines in it. You know, you're sitting there for a long time while this is being sung. But it's one of the things he did that built up the local community. He took all of these good women and gave them a voice within the body of Christ within that church of Edessa, and probably also in Nisibis, but certainly in Edessa. That is the building up. Because in the modern world, when we look at it, a lot of our Catholics who are very faithful get frustrated. And they want to use the methods that everybody else uses, which is get out into the streets and scream at other people. Beep your horn, wave signs. That's not how the gospel ever was transmitted. It might work for revolutions. You know, it's easy to break and burn things. It's hard to build, which is why the average human person doesn't want to build. Am I a builder or am I a corrupter? By nature, each of us were corruptors. I'd rather just worry about number one, me and be concerned about me. And for some people, their defense of the Catholic Catechism is actually not about Jesus, it's about me. I want to be right. And I'm going to make sure you understand that I am right. Well, that's not building up. It's subtle, but that's the kind of things that we learn as we go forward in the spiritual life. We have no recounting of St. Ephraim screaming in the streets though he is surrounded by pagans and all kinds of heretics. Now, the Christians in Edessa are not the majority of the city. I mean, they're a recognizable group, but they're certainly not. Edessa is not a Catholic town. In fact, at the time of St. Ephraim, the Catholics in Edessa were known as Paluzians because it was related to the Bishop of Antioch, whose name was Palut. I have no idea what that means. Palut, and because their bishop had been ordained by the Orthodox Bishop, the Catholic Bishop of Antioch, they were just called, that's their, that's their tribe, as we would say these days, that's their group. But even in that modern terminology of tribe, that's not a community. It's just that I link on to, usually through the internet, to some people who have an interest that I share. That's not a community. A community literally, communitas. Tas at the end of the words in Latin mean equality. Cum is together. Unum in the middle is one. Communitas literally means the quality of coming together as one. That is not a tribe. That is a unity that takes place among individuals based upon certain principles. One of the reasons why so many Catholic churches have fallen apart and dissolved is because of this me aspect. My Catholicism in that mindset is not about the Lord Jesus. It's about how I feel at church. 
that it makes me feel warm and tingly. It gives me nice memories. In other words, it satisfies my personal desires. That is not the gospel. And when you create religion upon that mindset, it is inevitable that logically, eventually, it all just unravels. Because the day that I decide that fishing, and I have heard this from Catholics, they miss them at Mass one Sunday, oh, it's because the fishing was really good. They find their transcendent, nice little internal feelings very nicely on Great Pond. And so I feel perfectly justified, in fact, in any way drawn to rather fish than to be locked into a building for an hour and a half. There is a great logic on why for every Catholic, everyone who converts to the Catholic Church statistically these days in America, for every single adult who converts to Catholicism, there are six Catholics who walk out. The Catholic Church is hemorrhaging. It's hemorrhaging because for generations we have been corruptors. It's about me. If I don't feel like this or feel like that, then I don't do it because that's the way I have been educated. So it is normal that when you appear in public and pray a rosary in front of an abortion clinic or even just try to talk to your cousins about the life of babies, they become hysterical, if not demonic. Because for generations now, not just the last 15, 20 years, but for generations now, religion has been about your personal whims, not the body of Christ. So when you say something, God forbid, like artificial birth control is a corruption of family life, that's your personal opinion. Which is why we have arrived at the logic that nothing is discussed substantially. Everything is personal attacks. Because of generations of corrupting me's, I don't care about somebody else's opinion. Now do I, logically? I only care about my own. So when you voice an opposite opinion, one, I don't really care, and two, if you insist upon it, like trying to explain why this is a rational belief, I hate you, and I will find a reason why I despise you. You understand how difficult this is. We have long since moved away from any kind of public debate. What we're living through now is not new. It's only the end result logically of something that we have been doing for almost a century and certainly very consciously doing for the last 50 years. So the question of what St. Paul, when he writes this letter to the Galatians, is saying is counteract your natural human tendency. Time is short. And while we have this time, do good. It's a very simple mandate. Show kindness and do good. And doing good means objectively good. Which means I desire the good for the other person. That's benevolence. And the other aspect of charity is beneficence. I do what good I can for them. But my friends, really, on this last day that we consider St. Ephraim, and though he wasn't a martyr, he suffered a lot during his life. For most of the history of the church, in any given generation randomly chosen out, and especially for all the early Christians of the church, all they could do in the public arena was die. Because in that public arena, there was no desire really to discuss anything. As you know, because we've all been to high school, right? We know that human beings work as herds. 
We know that we work under peer pressure, and that is the number one thing that motivates most people. Now, in a religious catechetical format, we call that human respect. The common term is peer pressure. You don't want to do what other people aren't doing. So after a century of movies of Hollywood and all the morality that comes out of these things, and even the old movies, if you go back and watch them, they are quite instructive to what's being taught. They were held up briefly because of the, leg the legion of decency that existed at one point, which has been long gone and dead. But the early Hollywood films were kind of quasi-soft porn. They were only lifted because Pius XI wrote an encyclical in 1937 and told the bishops in America, you have a responsibility to watch over what you're spewing out of Hollywood. There was a letter to the American bishops. That's the foundation of the, Legion of Dec of the League of Decency and the, and the vows, that the oaths, the promises that were made on a monthly basis in parishes across the country. It all dissolved in the 60s, like so much had done. But it's because you already have a corrupting influence underneath it. But when you go back and you look at it, and of course, you know, after 50 years of talk shows, that peer pressure of how to be normal and how to be free, that's what no one wants to discuss on abortion anything to do with babies. It's about being for freedom. And who wants to say, I want to shackle someone? Because that's the way the argument is portrayed publicly. So, of course, when you come in and say, but there's another person involved in this discussion, it is, no, it is never asked and never accepted as being a discussion about a third little person who's still immature and not even born yet. It's all about the fact that you are anti-rights. Because in America, we have discussed about rights and rights and rights and rights and rights and rights. But a couple months ago, I wrote up in the reflections in the bulletin, rights exist only because we have obligations. I have a right that you respect my personal property because I have an obligation through that personal property to be a productive member of the community not because somehow you just have to not violate my personal space. But that is what rights have come down to is, you allow me to do everything I feel like I want to do, and the other person says, that's great as long as you don't bug me. When you have come to that logic, there is no longer a community. There is a glob of individuals who are saying, yeah, that's cool. I respect your rights to do whatever you want. That's what rights mean now. As long as they don't get in the way of me and my rights. That is not a building up. That is not a unity. That is not a cum unitas in any stretch of the imagination. That's why in the 70s and the 60s, introducing the idea of multiculturalism in its principal enunciation is telling you there is no longer a community. Once you introduce the word multi, you no longer have a unified group. This is why America is so different. It's because we're founded and grouped by all kinds of different mentalities. There are no purple states. There are just places like Ohio that are settled by mountain people, borderlanders from the Appalachians in the southern part of Ohio. The middle part of Ohio was settled by all the descendants of those Quakers and Amish from Pennsylvania who just moved west. And then the northern part of Ohio, along with Michigan and Wisconsin, they're all founded, that whole colony was founded by New Englanders. So they think just like Yankees. Look at the map, you just see blue going, it goes right across. There are no purple states. There are just communities of people who to this day, 150, 200 years later, all have different cultural mindsets. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying you have to be aware of this. But when you come to the point where rights and the community is about me, this is the end of the community. There is no longer an unum. There is no longer a quality of coming together. 
to be one. And so yes, for those who watch this all dissolve, we are in a logical movement. And that's why the Christians in the early centuries and periodically like under Soviet Union, the only thing you can do in the public arena is be killed because there is no discussion going on. So when we have the ability to look and to read and have the text of someone like St. Ephraim, who gives reasons why the faith is believable, that is a great gift to the body of Christ. So on this last day, we ask our Lord, Christ the King, that in this modern world, where when you have everyone broken into atomized individuals screaming about their rights, this is the reason why proportionately you have the increase of loneliness, in the last, especially the last 25 years. Every time polls are done, you have the numbers going up and up and up of people who say they feel lonely. They don't have friends, regardless of what their Facebook says. That people have that sense of isolation. But the sense of isolation, as we know, is not resolved by family specifically, my spouse, my children, my parents. It's resolved by community. And this is why when things were healthier, you had your spouse, you had your children, you had your aunts, you had your cousins. That's one thing. But you also had the local club in town, you had where you went to work, you had a whole array of relationships when life was healthier. But when we've insisted on that corrupting aspect of just about me, we've dissolved into loneliness and the dissolution of community. So now when you go back and read this epistle from today, St. Paul is being very wise and very revolutionary by saying, do what good you can and help one another. You mutually assist one another. How did so many parishes dissolve in the last 50 years? Because basically coffee and donuts became, let's scream at each other about parish council issues, about what I want me in this parish and what I want in this parish and not what is good for the parish overall. That was a large part. It was just suicidal and internal. The government didn't kill your Catholic parishes. The government didn't close down your Catholic parishes. The government didn't close down your Catholic schools. The government didn't dissolve your Catholic convents, close down your monasteries. We do it to ourselves. And the responsibility of the body of Christ is not of pagans, but the responsibility of the building up of the body of Christ is ours, those of us who have been consecrated in the body of Christ. So let us ask Christ the King that he give us the eyes and that luminous eye that St. Ephraim talks about overcome the public tribalism and loneliness by desiring to build community, cum unum tas, to come together as one, to build up the body of Christ. And our generation may only be called to suffer, like the early Christians. And if that's your vocation in this generation, then suffer beautifully, with patience, and with a fine example. And in 2532, when they're celebrating your feast day, they will think about how gloriously and how wonderful you were as a woman of patience and equanimity and of serenity when you were drawn to your death or shot down in the streets. That itself builds up. And on the day of judgment, you will see it. So don't worry. You'll be able to participate in that goodness. And so that's why St. Paul says, for now, while we have time, which is pretty short, let us work for good for everyone, especially for those who are of the household of the faith. All these soup kitchens and everyone running out to take care of everyone else have missed the major directive of St. Paul's letter is you first take care of your brothers and sisters in the body of Christ and everything else God will take care of. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before our ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For our men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was in time with the Virgin Mary and became a man. For our sake he was crucified, he suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken in our hearts. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Almighty Lord in God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you. Out of their love for you and for your holy name, shower your spiritual blessings upon them, adding place of their earthly gifts, 
Grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the blessed mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom the sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Continue with the anaphora of St. John Chrysostom on page 876, 876. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord God and Father, holy and glorious is your name. You deliver those who love you from all that is contrary to your will. May we who have remained in your divine love be made worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with a holy kiss. May we always speak words of peace, think of peace, and work for peace. Through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, we raise glory to you and to your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord. From all creation, you are peace, reconciling those who are enemies. You are forgiveness to those who sin. You are comfort to those who are sorrowful. Open the door of your mercy to our petitions, and in the abundance of your grace, accept our prayers. Make us children and heirs of your kingdom through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, and through your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Lord, you are adored by all angels, bless you, humanity exalts you, and all creation glorifies you. 
Look upon your children who call out to you. Purity and holiness, may we offer you an acceptable sacrifice that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father, and the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. It is right and just. Truly it is right and just to thank, adore, glorify, and bless the majesty of the one consubstantial Trinity. All their Son and Holy Spirit, a majesty that does not need our glory, have become greater with our thanks. O Lord, those who sing your praises are calmness, and they cry out with angelic voices, and with sweet melodies proclaiming. exalted our weak human nature. In your mercy you sent your only Son into the world for our salvation. He dawned from the Holy Virgin like a ray of light from a bright cloud. He took the form of a slave, yet truly he is the Son of your majesty. He willingly became man to make us divine. He was born from a woman's womb that we may be born again from a spiritual womb. He became our brother, so that through his grace we may become your children and heirs. He took us from being slaves and made us your children. He promised us a share in the reward that allows us to call you Abba. He cleansed us from our sins with his precious blood that he poured out for us, for he is your only son. Pretty son. Wabiamo haudukum hashodi lema bed hayu, and sabe lahmo bidao kori shanto, o barahu kodesh, waxoya bel talimita koro mara, sabahola mehne kulho, ho no denita, fahro deal. Dachlo fai kun wach lov sagie me takase o me ti hem ho soyon ho me wa ho yedan alam alamin. Ho kano ol alko so damsi ho men hamro men mayo. Barahu Kodesh, Uyabel Talmita, Karomar, Sabishtawa Mehne Kulho, Hono Denita, the Mohondila di Antiki Hadato, Dahlo Faikun, Wahlov Sagi, Mete Shadu Meti Hem, Hosunyon. How may we hold on to Allah, Allah?
Do this in memory of me, each time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember my death until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your mercy rest upon us. O Word of God, who can comprehend that you willingly emptied yourself of your divine glory, who can explain your miraculous birth from a virgin, who can repay you for your saving passion which you freely endured, who can praise your plan of salvation for us. We can only ask of you, O lover of all people, that the sacrifice which we have offered be accepted on your altar in heaven, the dwelling place of your hidden divinity in the company of all the angels and saints. Through this sacrifice, may we be worthy of the forgiveness of our sins. When you come to judge the living and the dead, do not pass judgment upon us, nor deny us, saying, I do not know you. On that glorious and fearful day, do not separate us from you, nor cast us out of your paradise to a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Rather, because of your holy name by which we have been called, look with mercy upon us. In your compassion you have made us worthy of the gift of your forgiving body and blood. So make us worthy to be one with you in holiness as you are one with your Father. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, As we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you. We enjoy your spirit, descend upon us all. We profess our faith in you, we ask you, and compassion on us, O God. Have mercy on us and hear us. How awesome is this moment, O my beloved! For the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Manin morio, manin morio, manin morio, nite modo rojo chayu kadisho, onachen alainu aru korbono chono. body of Christ our God be for us a pledge of the life to come, a body that grants us the everlasting joys of heaven, a body that renews our souls and bodies, a body that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. And that the mixture in this chalice, the blood of Christ our God, be a blood that gives new life to those who receive it, a blood that guides us to the safe harbors and the dwellings of light, a blood that renews our souls and bodies, a blood that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. O Lord, in your great mercy, when this body and blood is mingled with our bodies and souls, Grant that it may be for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and for the everlasting joy and eternal life with all your saints. Amen. We offer you, Lord God, this pure and holy offering for your holy Catholic and apostolic church, which you have redeemed. Gather her children into unity, love, and faith, and guide them in peace and security. We offer for the pure bishops of the true faith, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bashara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, the Venerable Priests, the Chaste Deacons, the pure Subdeacons, and all the Orders of the Church. 
Teach them the word of truth so that they may spread it faithfully with justice and with holiness. May they care for the flock that you have entrusted to them. Give them the proper means to accomplish your will and grant them a long life. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the poor and dejected, for orphans and widows, for the sick and distressed, for those tempted by evil spirits, be the guardian and refuge of their lives. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember the Holy Fathers, prophets, apostles, preachers, evangelists, martyrs, and confessors, especially the holy, glorious, and blessed, ever Virgin Mary, Mother of God, St. John the Baptist, the messenger and forerunner who witnessed the betrothal of your holy church to your son, glorious St. Stephen, the archdeacon and first martyr, and all who pleased you and professed your name, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord have mercy. For all, all the faithful, faithful departed who have gone to you from this altar from every place throughout the world, grant them rest in your heavenly dwellings with all your saints, and in your mercy forgive our sins and theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, with or without full knowledge. O Lord, do not deprive us of your mercy, but keep us in the palm of your hand, lest we fall and go astray, so that we may walk on your paths, follow your ways, and do your will. Forgive us and our departed, and pardon all sins and transgressions, hidden and seen, committed with or without full knowledge. Make us worthy of a faithful Christian death that is pleasing to you and join us to your righteous ones and to those who have done your will, that in us and in all things your blessed name may be glorified with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, it is now, it shall be Lord, and you are the pleasing oblation who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice who offered yourself to your Father. You are the high priest who offered yourself as the Lamb. Through your mercy, may our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to your Father through you. To you be glory. O Lord, our Lord, you sent us your only Son, who is the radiance of your eternity. And he accomplished his plan of salvation for us, that we may call, come to you. May we call upon you with the prayer that he taught his holy disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Give us, Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the 
power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Yes, O merciful Lord, we ask for your compassion. By your grace, make us worthy that your glorious name may be holy in us, and that your kingdom come to assist us in our weakness, that your will dwell within us. Deliver us from all difficult temptations, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord God, you are good and the lover of all people. Look upon those who bow their heads before your majesty and bless them with every spiritual blessing. Do not turn us away when we approach your divine and holy gifts and let us not be guilty of unworthily receiving the body and blood of your only Son. Rather, make us worthy to share in your holy and life-giving mysteries with purity we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your good and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace and the most holy trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Amen. Your spirit. Let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with per perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth, to him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins, and for new life, O Lord our God, to you be glory forever.
Again and again, we thank you, Lord, and raise glory to you for giving us your body to you. It's more than blood to drink, the love of all people. Have mercy. Lord Jesus, you have made us worthy to share in your holy body and in the cup of salvation. How can we repay you for your, these, your gifts and graces, and for your goodness? As you have called us to approach this life-giving banquet, make us worthy, so that your body may be mingled with our bodies and your blood with our souls, for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and for eternal life. You are blessed and your kingdom is holy. We raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. O oh God the Father, we bow before you and we entrust ourselves to your care. We ask you, imploring your mercy, to rest your right hand full of blessings upon us. Assist us, protect us, bless us, and sanctify us by the cross of your only Son. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. 
May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.